So uh, once again, we're very, uh, very privileged to have Dr. Pete and his expertise joining us again this evening. Uh, are you there, Dr. Pete? Yes, hi. Okay, excellent. Um, so once again, um, for those people who perhaps have never heard of you um, or heard you speak or heard of your areas of expertise, would you outline your academic and professional background before we get started on tonight's show? Um, relative to um, nerve biology, um, that was my intended uh, major when I went to the University of Oregon as a graduate student in 1968 uh, because of, I had been interested in linguistics and, and psychology. But uh, as soon as I got there, uh, two or three months, I had, had decided to switch to uh, aging and reproductive physiology because of the great dogmatism in the nerve biology field. And uh, so I, I spent the three, four years uh, working on reproductive aging, and, uh, female reproductive aging in particular. So I concentrated on the effects of uh, estrogen, progesterone, thyroid, oxygen, and uh, antioxidants on the age-related changes uh, in metabolism. Okay, great. And I know for probably the last 35 years, is it, or is it more, uh, you've been doing your own research and you have been in uh, private consulting capacity uh, previously. I guess um must be uh, You're there? 40, 40 oh. years, I think. <laughs> Sorry. 40 years, okay. Okay, good. Well, I know... Uh, I've, uh, I've managed to speak to quite a few people over the years who've either come into contact with you uh, or have been, um, yeah, been given uh, good advice by you and have certainly making very good improvements in their health. So it's always good to be justified by people who are corroborating uh, what you have told them and where they were when they met you and where they subsequently were afterwards. So it's, it's always very heartening. I know a lot of um, what you've spoken about in the past has been fairly controversial. I know for me, when we first uh, got introduced to you, I think in 2007 or 8, um, a lot of what you said was very controversial. And in my education in herbal medicine, again, the same dogmatic, what I now know is the same dogmatic and erroneous uh, ideas in science were still perpetrated and uh, a lot of um, what you've been uncovering in the last six years or so has certainly got me thinking differently. Although it's very difficult to unlearn, I know it's a uh, it's a little bit like a, the constant suggestion that sugar's bad for you. Uh, the general public seems to just have it as part of their fact that sugar is bad for you, the same with salt. So I know the last couple of shows we've been talking about um, diabetes in particular, and um, I know that your most recent newsletter was relating to nerve damage, how to protect uh, and nourish nerves and restore them. So I think I wanted to start by saying that the uh, classical description of diabetes was or is a, uh, a wasting disease where the excess glucose is lost in the urine uh, as a byproduct of protein metabolism and the patient simply wastes away deprived of the needed energy production to sustain the cellular functions resulting in death. Uh, and obesity is now a universal disease recognized even here in the States. And obese diabetics are commonly presenting. So rather than the classic description of diabetes, medicine now uh, erroneously classes diabetes as insulin resistance as well as insulin dependence, uh, which is quite rare. But the truth is quite different mechanistically and more importantly from a treatment perspective. Would you explain the processes that you understand diabetes to stem from and outline your approach to its management? Um, my father happened to uh, be an example of the traditional, original type of diabetes. He wasted away to, a, I, I think it was under 100 pounds, and uh, it was just a few years after insulin had come into medical use, and uh, he didn't want to become dependent on it so he and my mother looked uh, through the old naturopathic medical literature and, and found that brewer's yeast had uh, sometimes cured people and so that he went on a brewer's yeast diet for several weeks and uh, recovered his weight and uh, lived 
the rest of his life uh, with no sign of diabetes. Do you know how much bruise yeast he was using? <laughs> it was, that was his only food, basically, for, <laughs> wow. for several weeks. Wow. Now, just uh, just refresh my memory. I know the B vitamins are the important part of bruise yeast, but specifically? And, and um, there are steroids in it and uh, potassium, a lot of potassium and uh, phosphate, which is not for general health. Uh, you can very easily get phosphate poisoning, but uh, probably it's one of the factors that uh, could could be involved in that effect, maybe by uh, having something to do with interfering with stress hormones. Um, okay, so your father recovered from a, a 100 pounds wasting away uh, using brewer's yeast as a fairly sole dietary uh, uh, constituent. Um, yeah, and the um, the cause, uh, I think there are probably many causes of the uh, tr- traditional wasting form of diabetes, but uh, a virus is, is one of the plausible theories that uh, can cause inflammation and, and uh, killing off temporarily of, of the insulin-producing cells. But... Uh, just very intense stress. Uh, there were experiments in which, uh, if part of the dog's pancreas was removed, so it had uh, uh, just a smaller reserve of insulin-producing cells, then a single injection of a large dose of cortisol was enough to mm. make the dog permanently diabetic. Wow! So that and extreme uh, stress caused by cortisol itself is an inflammatory. Uh uh, mediator. Yeah, and then to... once the tissues are unable to uh, get glucose just from that one episode of, of stress induced uh, uh, lack of insulin, mm-hmm. uh, the, the cells are uh, basically dying because they can't get the glucose they need, so they call on fatty acids from stores, and the fatty acid. Uh, in turn, kills uh, kills the uh, remaining or regenerating uh, insulin-producing cells. Uh, so it starts a vicious circle. Uh, just in, just I don't mean to interrupt you, but just in case people who are listening don't understand what a, a fatty acid is and a free fatty acid, would you would you just explain basically what they are and how they're used? Um, yeah, a, a fat such as butter or lard or corn oil. Uh, most of them consist of about 18 carbon atoms in a chain uh, with oxygens on one end making it acidic and the rest of it uh, either just plain carbon and, and hydrogen or occasionally with uh, 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 the hydrogens removed. That's called an unsaturated fatty acid uh, mm-hmm. with a, a carbon chain interrupted by pure hydrogens, and uh, those chains are attached to a glycerin molecule, three carbons, uh, uh, technically an alcohol that that forms an ester with these free fatty acids, uh, blocking the acid group, which makes the free fatty acid water soluble to some extent, and when the glycerin which is also very water-soluble, is combined with three fatty acids, it becomes very Mm water-insoluble. And that is um, the form in which it's stored in the fat cells because uh, you just form a a drop of pure fat in the cell, and it's very reluctant to uh, diffuse away because of its insolubility. So... Uh, when you need energy, you have to activate enzymes that uh, break the free fatty acids loose. When that happens from stress uh, or hunger or fasting, uh, these free fatty acids uh, get into the bloodstream and enter cells and uh, are available as energy production in the absence of glucose. Right, because the trouble is that. that Okay. That process also tends to keep the stress going if the free fatty acids are unsaturated. 
uh, those are more water soluble, and uh, when they're polyunsaturated, like from uh, corn oil, safflower oil, and so on, uh, those have a, a further stress-inducing action that tends to keep the um, breakdown of fat going and uh, the stress reproducing itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, normally, if somebody was uh, on a, because I know uh, people that are listening who've listened to you before know that you're a great advocate of saturated fats, butter, uh, and coconut oil in particular, and you're very much against uh, the negative health impacts of the uh, liquid oils and fish oil in particular. Um, if somebody's consuming a lot of butter and milk, uh, you know, whether it's uh, full fat or semi fat, um, and uh, coconut oil, the fats therein, um, when they are stored as fat, they don't have the same um, destructive, as if you like, or oxidative uh, effects when they're liberated. Um, yeah, if you store a very saturated fat, like the Indians make ghee by mm-hmm. removing the water-soluble material, right. a, a pure fat oil, or coconut oil, which is 98% saturated, uh, those things keep for years without breaking down. But if you leave a bottle of safflower or corn oil or um, linseed oil uh, open uh, within hours or days, you can detect uh, spontaneous oxidation of it in the air. And that happens at body temperature uh, with the high oxygen content of your blood. happens very quickly with the polyunsaturated fats. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, the biological oxidation is pretty much the opposite because uh, if you have two types of fat circulating in your bloodstream, one saturated fatty acid and one polyunsaturated, your muscles will be able to oxidize the saturated fat preferentially Hmm. and the polyunsaturated fat tends to go into storage if you eat more than you can oxidize. Hmm. Uh, So you it tends to be fattening uh, if you uh, eat a little extra of the polyunsaturated because it stores more easily. Okay, get but, uh, your, your fat cells can also oxidize saturated fat, and so they live on the saturated fat that they have stored. And so over the years, stress is more likely to release the polyunsaturated fats, making stress an increasing problem with age. Right, so that, that's the thing behind what you're describing now as the uh, component free fatty acids. If, um, if somebody's eating a lot of saturated fats like butter, uh, ghee, or coconut oil, then they're not going to liberate the same free fatty acid that they would if they were consuming polyunsaturates in their diet. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, it, don't mind me, but get, getting, getting back to the classic description of uh, diabetes as being a wasting disease, which actually we see very little of, uh, as opposed to what now is generically termed as diabetes and is very largely linked to obesity in the general population, that, that obesity was probably directly linked to the polyunsaturated thyroid suppressive uh, diets that people consume. Um, yeah, it's now increasingly seen as a fat inflammation condition, <laughs> okay. a mild chronic inflammation. And a major thing that causes that is the uh, continual spontaneous release of small amounts of arachidonic acid, mm-hmm. which is a highly unsaturated fatty acid that... Uh, even if you don't eat it, linoleic acid, for example, will be turned into it by, by enzymes in the body. So it becomes one of the uh, most toxic stored uh, fats, both in phospholipids and in the triglyceride storage. Okay. And uh, when that's released, uh, that allows it to be turned into various things, but especially prostaglandins, which are uh, probably... Our, our biggest inflammatory problem. And these things are associated with in, inflammation, aren't they? When you damage your tissues, prostaglandins is the thing that most people might recognize as being liberated, uh, causing swelling and edema. 
you know, they're why aspirin is so great. Yeah. Okay, well, for those people uh, who perhaps have just tuned in, you're listening to Ask Your Rev Doctor on KMUD Garberville 91.1 FM. Uh, we are very pleased and uh, very lucky to have Dr. Raymond Pete sharing his expertise on the show tonight. And the subject of tonight's show is uh, how to restore uh, nerve tissue. Uh, prevent the damage and or restore it um okay so dr pete getting back again to um diabetes or i guess i should mention the fact that we have a toll-free number is 1-800-KMUD-RAD or the local number is 923-3911 um so back to diabetes again how do you, how do you um how do you approach it uh, rather than uh, the orthodoxy with uh, you know metformin or insulin and or avoidance of glucose even. It's uh, contrary, perhaps. Um, if you focus on stopping the liberation of uh, fatty acids from your tissues and uh, inhibit their uh, conversion to uh, prostaglandins, uh, you can usually very quickly uh, lower your blood sugar quite a bit and feel better. Okay. And... Um, the two chemicals that uh, are most practical for uh, lowering free fatty acids and stopping the stress reaction are niacin amide, which uh, has many effects, but the first one that it's commonly associated with is inhibiting the lipase that liberates fats from your fat stores. What did you say again? Inhibits the? Uh, the? The enzyme which um, liberates the uh, free fatty acids okay. from the triglyceride storage. Okay. And um, aspirin also does that, uh, and several other things relating to uh, liberation of uh, free fatty acids and their conversion to the inflammatory mediators. Okay, so both niacinamide and aspirin do that job of uh, decreasing the liberation of free fatty acids. Do you know the mechanism by which that's um, working? Um, in um, the case of aspirin, it's, it's both indirect and direct actions on uh, at least two different uh, lipase enzymes, uh, both phospholipase and uh, uh, the adipose hormone-sensitive uh, lipase that, that in- insulin controls. So an uh, insulin deficiency in itself liberates more of the free fatty acid. Hmm. And, and so uh, both of these are acting directly on the enzyme, which is uh, caused to be overactive by an insulin deficiency. Yeah. Just for example, I know because most people are pretty uh, frightened, I think, for want of a better word, of using aspirin. Whenever I mention aspirin to people, the first thing is, is they're always very shocked that I mention aspirin. It's almost a complete taboo. Um, obviously, when people start listening and reading the facts about it, they get a different opinion, and as time goes on, they begin to realize that perhaps uh, there's actually something very good in it. I know that you've, um, and I've read some recent articles about its antiviral activity, and they're actually looking at it pretty, uh, pretty intensively for other conditions uh, surrounding uh, potential virus problems, but its main anti-inflammatory effect is uh, pretty useful widespread. So do you, what would you suggest as a, uh, a dose for aspirin? Because uh, the other thing that people worry about is uh, how much uh, the bleeding, they may get bleeding if um, you know, they're using too much. And I know that you recommend using vitamin K as a one milligram per drop per um, 325 milligram tablet. Um, yeah, yeah, especially if a person has combined antibiotics with aspirin, they might have lost the uh, intestinal bacteria that make vitamin K. And eating lots of uh, cooked greens such as kale and liver are are the best, and some types of cheese are are the best sources of uh, vitamin K. Do you think most people produce enough vitamin K to offset uh, any potential? um, I don't think it's reliable to count on your intestinal bacteria because so many things can interfere. And we'll get into the subject of endotoxin a bit later, and that's also tied up with diabetes, so that's, that's pretty interesting. Okay, so what do you think in terms of a dose of aspirin as a kind of realistic? Um, um, I, if your vitamin K is okay, I think it's fine to take two or 300 milligrams 
every day, and if it's to correct a, a problem such as diabetes or some chronic inflammatory problem, then up to, uh, I know people who have temporarily uh, taken six or 7,000 milligrams wow. a day, wow. Uh, wow. like um, 20 standard aspirin wow. tablets, for example. Uh, a little bit off um, off base, but I remember hearing about somebody who'd uh, got a recovery from HIV from using high-dose aspirin. Yeah, there was a study that uh, <laughs> at the government, uh, I think, canceled it when it looked like it was going to be too successful uh, because it would be terrible for the drug industry. And very cheap. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, let's not. I don't want to get too much off off the track here because I've got plenty of uh, questions I wanted to ask you. Uh, we do actually have a couple of callers lined up, so perhaps we should take a couple of callers here, and I'll carry on uh, asking you um, about what you've recently found out. So, first caller, you're on the air, and uh, where where are you calling from, caller? Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, you're on the this air. This is where, Gina from Kansas City. Okay. Hi. Hi. I have a couple of questions. Um, one is about uh, my liver enzyme. I have a high ALT. Mm -hmm. um, any suggestions? Yeah. Okay. Oh, what was the enzyme? ALT. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, um, when anything is stressed in any cell, um, for example, just hypothyroidism, uh, lowers the energy production of a cell, makes it tend to take up water, and when it takes up water, it becomes somewhat porous, and its natural enzymes leak out into the bloodstream. And uh, just by looking at, at the type of enzyme, you can't be sure whether it's coming from a, a leg muscle that you strained or overstressed, or a heart muscle that is, is being or the liver. Uh, the liver is, is usually the, uh, the place that, that they, they look for uh, enzymes that are uh, concentrated in the liver. And, and so ALT is one of those. Okay, and then what was your other question? Um, the other one is about uh, greens. What is it? A good amount to have. I cannot digest the vegetables, but I take leafy greens, the broth, and I do raw juice, which is the only things I can digest. Um, how much would you suggest I have uh, per week? What to meet my nutritional needs? How much of which? I, th I think the lady was trying to describe green greens, as in broths, as in yeah, the, the cooked green. Yeah. Uh, if you eat it by the cups and the quarts, it's an adequate source of protein. Uh, but if you aren't eating it as your main food for protein, uh, then uh, oh, half a cup to a cup a day will provide your vitamin K and a generous amount of magnesium and uh, calcium. Uh, those are the, the nutrients that quickly cook out of it into the broth. And so if you drink only the water that you cooked a cup or so of leaves in, uh, then you get a, a little supplement of magnesium and calcium. Okay, did you... Okay. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, uh, raw juicing? Uh, it's pretty uh, irritating to the intestine. Uh, plants put uh, their most intense defensive toxins into their seeds, but their next most intense irritants and toxins are in the leaves because they don't want to be grazed. <laughs> so they, they put chemicals in that tend to block your digestive enzymes. And cooking uh, destroys most of those toxins or, or reduces them. And, and so if you eat them uh, raw and if you aren't a, a ruminant, that has evolved a stomach to handle raw leaves, then you're most likely to have some digestive problems. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks for your questions. Let's take the next caller. Caller, where are you from? Uh, this is David in Missouri. Oh, hi, David. Hello. 
Uh, I wanted to come back to aspirin real quick, if that's okay. Um, Dr. Pete, I've heard you in a podcast before, I'm pretty sure, mention that um, aspirin is helpful in reducing tumor growth. And I was just wondering about that. And then the other thing is, I don't know if you're familiar with a aspirin powder. It's, it's uh, called BC, and it actually has caffeine in it. And what I've been doing, just because I have a knee that hurts me off and on, you know, have, have quite a bit of pain in it, especially depending on what I'm doing. But um, I actually have been putting baking soda and um, magnesium sulfate or Epsom salt, and sometimes I'll even put some magnesium chloride in, and then these aspirin with this caffeine. Um, caffeine. And, and the baking soda, which I've heard you say about the baking soda, I think I understood this correctly, that it creates a gradient that pulls those things into the body. Is that also correct? Um, it, oh, it, it has uh, diuretic effects and some anti-inflammatory effects from the uh, carbon dioxide itself. Uh, and the caffeine acts on some of the same enzymes that aspirin does with an anti-inflammatory effect, uh, and they both uh, increase your um, cell respiration, and they both uh, suppress nitric oxide, which is uh, one of our uh, central uh, risky uh, pro-inflammatory mediators, which happens to poison the mitochondrial respiration, uh, blocking it directly. Uh, so uh, uh, caffeine and aspirin have multi levels of uh, defense of the mitochondria. And will that be pulled in through the skin effectively, more than likely? Um, caffeine goes in through the skin more easily than aspirin, but uh, yeah, some aspirin is absorbed. Okay. And then, so everything that you just said, I guess, applies to tumor growth to a certain degree as well? Um, yeah, uh, inflammation and uh, respiratory uh, defect is uh, the, the motor for uh, cancer growth. And uh, it happens that if you restore energy production in the mitochondria, uh, you're also lowering the inflammatory stimulants that... Uh, uh, activate uh, cell division and spreading. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. I appreciate your call. We have a couple more on the uh, on the line already, so let's just make sure everyone gets a chance here. So thanks for your call. Uh, next caller, where are you from? Uh, I'm calling from Sacramento. Okay. Ah, you're on um, the air. Um, I, I had a couple of questions for uh, Dr. Pete about substances that induce the process of uh, what's called uh, mitochondrial uncoupling, okay. uh, which I believe uh, reduces ATP production and generates body heat instead. And some of these substances have you know, generated a fair amount of controversy in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so my first question is, is, if this reduced ATP production is in any way harmful to the body, uh, yeah, and actually, um, the um, uncouplers, uh, when it's a mild degree of uncoupling, it um, prevents uh, some of the stray free radical products that happens in the more relaxed, uh, lower-intensity mitochondrion. So they know that uh, you reduce uh, free radical damage a little by an increasing uncoupling. But uh, another substance which uncouples mitochondria uh, also lowers ATP a little bit and uh, uh, greatly uh, protects the, uh, the mitochondrion from free radicals. Uh, that's fructose. Uh, fructose absorbs oh. excess uh, uh, phosphate ions uh, probably uh, that's related to why it uh, lowers the ATP. But the absorption of the phosphate ions by fructose is, in a way, a, a direct defensive uh, system of the oxidative system because 
the pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme, which is uh, suppressed in cancer. Uh, it's why uh, uh, dichloroacetate is uh, gaining so much interest because uh, it's a chemical that reactivates pyruvate dehydrogenase and uh, uh, improves the cancer metabolism in a great variety of tumors. Uh, but uh, simply uh, lowering the free phosphate in the cell tends to reactivate this crucial enzyme at the top of the uh, energy-producing chain. And uh, uh, when you are supplied with aspirin, caffeine, and uh, fructose, for example, um, you are not calling on free fatty acids. If you load up the cell with excess <clears throat> free fatty acids, uh, for, for example, from uh, some stress, the, the free fatty acids reverse all of those processes. They block pyruvate dehydrogenase uh, by uh, making more uh, phosphate uh, ions available uh, where the, the sugars uh, bind them and lower the free phosphates. Fatty acids increase them and, and tend to poison the uh, the crucial enzyme. Hmm. Okay, I guess I'll listen to that one more time on the radio. Uh, the uh, so, so basically, this process of producing heat uh, does that in any way negatively affect the thyroid? Because uh, you know, isn't that what's supposed to kind of generate heat in the body? So if this uncoupling generates heat. Does that you know um, down yeah, that, the thyroid? I, it increases uh, heat, among other things, um, and uh, keeping your your body temperature up to an efficient high level um, makes all of your tissues uh, more stable. Okay. Oh, so, so it doesn't harm the thyroid in any way. Uh, this process of uncoupling. Oh no, no. The the, the thyroid is is very compatible with that. Uh, keeping yourself slightly hyperthyroid uh, doesn't uh, stress anything. In fact, it keeps down those those uh, stress signals. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. B. Okay, well, thank you for your call. Uh, I think, do we have another caller on the end? We have another caller, and we've got a couple questions. Uh, we do have more callers, and let's go to one of those callers right now. Okay, caller, you're on the air, and where are you from? Good evening, Andrew and Dr. Pete. This Hi. is uh, Mike from uh, New York. New York, all right. <laughs> go, go ahead, Mike. Um, Dr. Pete, you mentioned earlier about using niacinamide, and I was wondering if there is a minimal dose, a range, and an upper limit for people to try it. Um, I've seen really great results from uh, something in the range of... Uh, 150 to 300 milligrams per day divided into three smaller doses. But uh, I also know people who have taken over 1,000, 1,500 milligrams for a very long time and haven't had problems. But uh, mainly because uh, all of the manufactured supplements are going to have trace allergenic impurities, uh, I think it's best to find the smallest amount that works for you. Does niacinamide need to be balanced out with any other B vitamin or other uh, supplements? Oh, um, uh, ribo uh, thiamine, vitamin B1, is um, works with the, the um, respiratory enzymes. And, uh, of course, you need all of them. Uh, B12 and B1 and biotin are very closely involved with the respiratory apparatus. And you've discussed many times in your articles and in interviews about the benefits of vitamin B6, and um, some people have found that they do better with the, the active form, uh, P5P or PLP. And I was wondering, aside from trial and error, if there's any other indicators or history that a person might find that they need the active form as opposed to the, uh, the typical form. <laughs> 
with either form of vitamin B6, it's possible to overdose. And I think people are, are finding that the active form is easier to overdose with. It used to uh, take several hundred milligrams uh, several months uh, to produce uh, toxic effects on the nerves. But uh, some people are seeing it with as little as 50 milligrams over a prolonged time with the active form. And uh, I think it's good to start with 10 milligrams, which is uh, far beyond the normal day's requirement. Uh, 10 to 20 milligrams is almost always all a person needs therapeutically of B6. And you, you've discussed with the um, using the carrot salads to lower the intestinal load of bacteria. And I was wondering if after some months' time, a person doing that has not found relief or their symptoms haven't relieved, that if they were to try the, if you're familiar with it, the, the drug metronidazole and also goes by the name of Flagyl uh, as treatment for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Uh, would well, that be perhaps a safe drug for a person to uh, try after some time? That, that happens to be a pretty toxic antibiotic. Um, so I think it's good to try a lot of other things first. Um, oh. uh, there are some bacterial products that are more actively uh, germicidal in the intestine. Uh, there's one that uh, comes from Ukraine called Biosporin that uh, has very <clears throat> germicidal bacteria in it. And uh, uh, I think there are some in intestinal de uh, detoxifying or de disinfecting antibiotics that are... Uh, a lot safer than metronidazole. I understand that there's a link with a SIBO with um, the several conditions, but one of them is rosacea, for example, and there's a connection with hydrogen-producing bacteria and, and, methane, or, and or methane-producing bacteria, and, and therefore that uh, flagell or rifaximin is another uh, antibiotic that, it's, that has gone to. But if it is, it is not safe, is there a uh, one that you would recommend before that? Um, Maybe um, you. No, I haven't had experience with those. Oh, okay. Um, and this is going back quite a ways. I think six months. In an interview, Doctor Pete, you, you mentioned uh, anecdotally about people with leukemia uh, treating it with uh, raw eggnog, and I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate on that. It's very interesting. Um, well, uh, they were using a whole eggnog. I don't think it was just the white. Oh, yes, the, the yolk primarily. Um, yeah, and the uh, uh, fresh egg lecithin itself uh, has been shown to have um, uh, antiviral activities, um, antibacterial too, but um, the I think the white of the egg is peculiar for its ability to bind minerals and... Uh, the combination of the lecithin and, and the raw egg white uh, probably has some special germicidal effect. Okay, I'll, uh, thank you very much, and I'll let the caller on. Okay, Good night, gentlemen. Thanks for your call. Well, we do have another caller on the air, so let's take this next caller. Caller, you're on there. Where are you from? Well, uh, this is uh, Dr. Pete. This is um, the Herb Doctor's engineer, and two callers asked me to ask you a question. I'm going to ask them in the uh, order they were they came in, but you might want to answer the second one first because it's something you addressed already tonight. The two questions are: uh, the first caller wanted to know. Uh, would like the good doctor to talk about dehydration and what are the water requirements of the body. The other question uh, was, if, could you give a brief uh, explanation of the difference between nutritional yeast and brewer's yeast? Um, the two types of yeast, uh, there are actually many strains, uh, and they taste different. Uh, the brewer's yeast that actually comes from a brewery uh, generally has uh, uh, hops flavor in it, and so it's very bitter. And uh, uh, the yeasts 
have been grown specially uh, for making nutritional supplements, and so some of them have added uh, chemical substances such as, uh, I think, selenium is one that they commonly add. And uh, but basically, the, the yeast uh, chemistry in itself is uh, always rich in B vitamins. And hydration, uh, keeping your cell energy up, I think is the basic thing. Uh, you want to keep the cell water under control uh, and uh, neither too hydrated nor too dehydrated. And uh, the um, regulating minerals, uh, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and, and calcium, uh, is part of, of that, uh, keeping the balance between intracellular water and extracellular water. But uh, the thing about uh, drinking extra water when you're not thirsty, uh, I think thirst is almost always a good indicator of how much you need. If you're drinking, uh, for example, milk and fruit juice, uh, that can, can provide all the water you need. And to try to add extra water uh, can disturb your mineral balance and hormone balance. For example, too much water in relation to the minerals uh, tends to increase your prolactin because prolactin is a water and salt regulating hormone, among other things. So it's probably more important to emphasize not to push excess water uh, rather than to remind people to drink because uh, usually thirst tells them when. Okay. That's good. Now, now, Doc, I know you had some other questions for Dr. P tonight. Are you still going to take calls? There's one caller on the oh, yeah. line. Yeah, you... we are. And I wanted, uh, Engineer, if uh, if you take any calls from people when they want to have it off the air, would you just find out where they're from? Because I'm just trying to build some demographics of who. Okay, listening. that's. I will be glad to do that. Thank you. I mean, if they want to do it off air, otherwise we'll be asking them. Okay. Okay, great. So next caller, you're on the air, and where are you from? Hello. Hello, you're on the air, and where are you calling from? Y you need to turn your radio off. Did you hear that? You need to turn your radio off firstly, otherwise we'll get a lot of feedback. Hello. Hi. So if you've turned your radio off, um, where are you from? Hi, um, Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City. Okay, great. So what was your question? Okay, I just wanted to know if the, what would you apply on your face to get rid of age spots, please? Okay. Dr. Pete, um, oh, age, age um, spots. Well, it uh, depends on what, what they're made of. Uh, sometimes... High estrogen or high polyunsaturated fats can cause uh, a fairly sudden appearance of age spots um. at an area that's irritated or sun exposed. And uh, uh, changing your diet away from the polyunsaturated fats and adding a little vitamin E, rubbing some vitamin E into those spots can help to uh, remove them. There are enzymes that can break down even uh, fairly old, long-standing uh, lipofuscin pigment, and uh, vitamin E is an activator of that. Um, okay. But if, if it's uh, largely a sun-induced uh, spot, you might try rubbing some niacin amide, uh, dissolve a high-potency niacin amide tablet uh, in just a tiny amount of water and apply that to the spot every day for a week or two, and it, it fades okay. a lot of the pigments. And uh, Dr. Pete, I think this is because of estrogen and PUFAs um, over a long period of time. And also, uh, the vitamin E you get in capsules, it always has some, it's soy derived. Is that okay, or should I go for a purer form of vitamin E? Um, I think a, a pure high potency vitamin E is is good 100 or 200 milligrams orally is probably enough but you can put a a little on a, a spot and uh, sometimes that helps the enzymes to clear it out okay thank thank you so much dr pete i'll be talking to you soon <laughs>
OK, well, thanks so much for your call, caller. I don't know, engineers anymore? OK, so we have no more callers. But anyway, let's, uh, let's give out the number again, but I've only just started asking you, Dr. Pete, uh, what I wanted to ask you about your okay. newsletter. So uh, the number here, uh, if people are listening, they want to call Dr. Pete about anything either related or unrelated to this night's show on uh, nerve, how to restore nerves and protect them. Um, the number is 923-3911 if you live in the area. Or there is a 1-800 number, which is 1-800-KMUD-RAD if you live outside the area. So, Dr. P, um, getting back to the uh, topic of tonight, I know I um, asked you about the, the treatment uh, with aspirin. You mentioned niacinamide as very good uh, modifiers or regulators of free fatty acid expression. Um, so I wanted to ask you, even in the presence of uh, supplemented insulin, for say, for people that are truly insulin diabetic um the the nerve damages or the neuropathies as they call them uh, these processes um that uh, diabetics still get even in the presence of insulin um and those sensation loss that they get particularly uh, in the feet or the soles of the feet uh, which are the kind of initial symptoms of so-called sugar excess syndrome how is the process at odds with excess sugar when sugar is a vital energy producing uh, producing currency um I've gone through uh, many articles. Uh, recently, I, I watched a video by uh, Gershom Zajcik, who's a, a very amazing uh, biology a, a medical professor in Israel. And uh, he has a very good understanding of physiology, and he, was, he has a video on diabetes and explains uh, how the increased uh, blood glucose is called for by the brain uh, to uh, make up for its needs. And, uh, but after explaining uh, the uh, compensatory effect of high glucose for the brain, uh, he uses the term uh, glycotoxic for, for the harmful effects, supposedly, of glucose. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, he just uh, resorted to a word to explain how glucose uh, affects the other organs. And looking through the literature, I see that, that people do that without really explaining what's happening, uh, why extra glucose would be harmful uh, if it's within a, a moderate uh, osmolarity. Uh, the um, mechanism just isn't explained, uh, even though they... they say that it's doing the harm. And uh, the changes in, in the nerves uh, include everything that uh, is failing because of lack of energy. And uh, when the, the cells are known to be living on fatty acids, and the fatty acids are intrinsically uh, disturbing the metabolism of, of uh, phosphate turning off uh, glucose energy production, slowing down, and even activating nitric oxide, the respiratory inhibitor, mm -hmm. um, you know that the, the energy of uh, the cell being reduced is going to slow all kinds of repairing processes. And uh, incidentally, in the pancreas, uh, glucose stimulates regeneration of new insulin-producing cells, and it's the bad balance, too much uh, free fatty acids and not enough glucose to defend the cells that, that causes them to die. And uh, anywhere that a cell is being deprived of energy and forced to um, eat fatty acids instead, uh, it, that's now well recognized in heart failure uh, that uh, a simple treatment such as uh, niacinamide can uh, restore uh, great amounts of uh, heart energy production and, and improve the, the failure. Uh, drugs are being developed to do the same as aspirin and, nitric and uh, niacinamide. Um, but in nerves... One of the effects of failing energy is uh, the inability to make cholesterol and to convert cholesterol 
into the neurosteroids um, when a, a nerve or its supporting cells, uh, the glial cells, uh, when they're injured by anything, including a lack of glucose or a lack of oxygen, uh, they not only stop producing the defensive uh, uh, steroids from uh, cholesterol, but they begin producing estrogen. Hmm. And the diabetic uh, brain and nerves and all of the diabetic tissues have more aromatase than a normal person of the same age. Um, more of the enzymes which uh, convert uh, androgens to estrogens. And the estrogen in a healthy person, uh, when the nerve is stressed, uh, the activation of this uh, enzyme, which is normally inactive in a nerve, um, stress activates the production of a little estrogen, which sends out signals to the surrounding cells to cause them to produce pregnenolone, progesterone, allopregnanolone, and a whole range of protective nerve steroids. But if you don't have the energy, you get stuck in producing mm -hmm. just the estrogen, uh, which keeps things excited and stressed. Got it. I, I need to, uh, I'm sorry, but I do actually need to pause it right there and just give out some of your information before the top of the hour to let uh, people know how to find out uh, how to reach more of your information Dr. Peter, thanks so much for joining us again on the show tonight and um, potentially next month can we carry on because uh, I didn't hardly ask you anything about the subject Okay. <laughs> okay thanks so much for joining mm -hmm. us thanks. thanks okay so for those people um, who've listened to Dr. Pete tonight and know him, uh, and for those people who've just heard him and are interested to find out more about him, his website, www.raypeat.com, R-A-Y-P-E-A-T.com. Uh, he's not selling anything. Um, he's just doing pure research. And uh, what really bears out the fruit of his research is the uh, stunning amount of people who've uh, commented on how much better they've gotten after taking his advice, uh, doing the seemingly uh, controversial uh, or contraindicated. Um, and that's often the way. There's lots of research out there. And um, unfortunately, it takes a very long time to get to mainstream medicine. Unfortunately, mainstream medicine is driven by a very, very well-oiled machine. And that very well-oiled machine has some huge resources uh, behind it to keep uh, drugs going and to keep patients using drugs not to say that everything is bad it's not it's just to say that there's a lot of hidden truth out there which uh, unfortunately takes a long time to come to surface but uh, dr pete's articles are fully referenced and uh, it's very scientific information so it's just common sense uh, unfortunately we are seeing some of this common sense come to bear in uh, terms of the polyunsaturated oils now being uh, now being condemned. So anyway, uh, www.raypeat.com, and we can be reached uh, after, well, Monday through Monday through Friday, nine to five, uh, one eight 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 WBM Herb for further questions. So it's the uh, spring vernal equinox, and uh, yeah, all the best. So I'll speak to you next month.